South Tyrol is a region in northern Italy, which stands apart from all the others because its most spoken language is German, not Italian. Today, with the existence of the European Union, the Schengen Agreement and its autonomous status, this is not a huge problem. In the 1930s, however, the situation was a bit different and both Germany and Italy were looking for a solution to the South Tyrolean question and finally agreed on a settlement of the local population. What led to that decision? How was the whole process handled? And what were its consequences? At the start of the First World War, Italy and Austria were a part of the same military alliance, together with Germany, the so-called Triple Alliance. However, many Italian irredentists were unhappy about the alignment with Austria, as lands such as Trentino and Istria were seen as occupied territories that must be brought back into the Italian fold. Austrian officials and generals never fully trusted the Kingdom of Italy and were constantly talking about a possible preemptive strike. So, the alliance was more or less never going to function properly in the first place, when you have two countries who both lay claims on the other's territories. One year after the war broke out, in January of 1915, the Italian ambassador in Vienna, the Duke of Avarna, officially demanded territorial concessions from Austria, and after a bit of pressure from Berlin, the Austrians reluctantly agreed to a compromise. However, the Allies promised more. In the Treaty of London, Italy was guaranteed all of Trentino right until the Brenner Pass, which included German-speaking South Tyrol, if only they joined the war on the side of the Allies. And indeed, the Treaty of Saint-Germain formally transferred South Tyrol to Italy, despite heavy protests from the local population. The area was turned into the administrative entity of Venezia Tridentina, and in 1920, the South Tyrolians were granted Italian citizenship, which allowed them to vote in the 1921 Italian general elections. The South Tyrolians couldn't enjoy their right to vote for long, because on the 1st of October 1922, hundreds of fascists from Upper Italy marched into the city of Bautzen and occupied both the town hall and the Kaiserin Elisabeth school without much resistance, raised the Italian flag and essentially abolished all sorts of democratic institutions. When Il Duce Benito Mussolini seized power in Rome just shortly after, Italianization measures began to be imposed onto the region. In April of 1923, Italian names for all the towns, villages, streets, mountains and rivers were introduced. Those new names were mostly just made up by neurodentists and nationalists called Ettore Tolomei, who had been pushing for an Italian South Tyrol since his very early days. And so, Bozen became Bolzano, Brixen became Bressanone, Sterzing became Vipiteno, De Grunsee became the Lago Verde, and the Chuckelberg became the Monzogollo. Even the usage of the word Tyrol became forbidden, and instead the name of Alto Adige was introduced. Half a year later, Italian became the sole language that was allowed to be used in all public offices, as well as in public writings. German newspapers were made illegal, and court cases were only processed if they were in Italian. But none of these measures had the desired effect, even after 20 years. Back to the video in just a second, let's first hear a quick word from today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. Atlas offers you the best and most affordable VPN deal on the market for just $1.83 per month, with an extra 3 months for free with a 30 day money back guarantee, if you use the link in the description. The app is extremely well designed and easy to use and it allows you to connect to 45 different countries with the press of a single button. Splendid. As soon as you've established a connection you can keep your internet searches in private. With a single subscription you can protect an unlimited amount of devices, be it computers, mobile phones or Android TVs. On top of that, Atlas also has other neat features that block annoying ads, malicious links and trackers, and they even notify you when someone is trying to steal your precious data. But that's not all. If you like travelling, and of course you do, you could potentially save some cash on sites like Booking.com, which determine your prices based on your current location. So this VPN essentially pays for itself. Atlas can also help you access content that isn't normally available in your country, be it on Netflix, Steam or YouTube. Once again, Atlas VPN is running a very tempting discount right now, where you can get a 3 year subscription for just $1.83 per month, with 3 months for free and the 30 day money back guarantee. So click on the link in the description and grab yourself this sweet deal. After the Anschluss of Austria in 1938, hopes sprang up all over South Tyrol that the region would finally be returned to a German speaking country. Only few were able not to be carried away by nationalistic fervour and to realise that Adolf Hitler had absolutely no interest in South Tyrol. He was a huge admirer of Mussolini and had repeatedly stated in the 1920s that he would lay no claims on this land. In an interview with the Corriere Italiano he stated, The question of South Tyrol is nowhere near as important as the question of Alsace-Lorraine or of Upper Silesia. 
As a national socialist, I am indeed able to empathise with the Italian thought process and I even understand the Italian claim to secure border. In 1929, he publicly declared in Munich that we feel deeply the misfortune of our separated friends in South Tyrol as national socialists, but we have to give up a part in order to save the whole. And even after he had annexed Austria, Hitler laid no claims on South Tyrol, instead preferring it to keep warm relations with his possible ally. But still, the problem had to be addressed somehow, and many voices calling for a possible resettlement of the German population began to make themselves heard. Already in 1914, Tolomei stated that the right of the Italian nation comes before the right of residence. He demanded that the German impurities, which today are almost exclusively dominant in the Alto Adige area, be expelled and chased back over the Brenner Pass. The 200,000 Germans who pollute South Tyrol must bear the biblical guilt for the sins of their fathers. The Greco-Turkish population exchange in the 1920s inspired many hardcore nationalists, but not just from the Italian side. Hermann Göring was also a strong advocate for the resettlement idea, and in spring of 1938 first talks between the German and the Italian governments began. The German stance was quite clear and obvious. Göring and the Consul General Max Lorenz wanted a complete resettlement of all South Tyrolians to a yet unconquered and unspecified territory in Eastern Europe. The Italian stance was a bit more ambiguous. Most just desired a partial resettlement of about 20 to 40,000 so called Reichsdeutsche, intellectuals, unemployed, and unskilled laborers, that could very easily be replaced by ethnic Italians. Mussolini only became fully convinced to solve the South Tyrol question the way that Germans desired it after the invasion of Czechoslovakia. Hitler was still fully guaranteeing the Italo-German border along the Brenner, but he sort of gained a reputation for himself as someone who doesn't exactly keep his promises. On the 23rd of June 1939, Hitler and Mussolini both officially agreed to resettle the German-speaking population in both South Tyrol and in Trentino, and in October of the same year, the Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler was tasked with organising the whole operation. The South Tyrolians were given a choice. They could either opt for German citizenship and leave South Tyrol for the Greater German Reich, or they could stay, keep their Italian citizenship and continue to endure the Italianization policies, with the additional threat that they would be forcefully deported south of the River Po. The Völkischer Kampfring Südtirols, or VKS, was an illegal national socialist organization initially dedicated to uniting South Tyrol with the German Reich. Initially, the VKS strictly opposed the South Tyrolian option and claimed that this was the sole order of Hitler which they would refuse to follow up on. But after Himmler's promise that the South Tyrolians would be settled in a region of their choosing, the VKS changed their course of action and became one of the most important propaganda organs for the option. A wave of propaganda soon swept over South Tyrol. Flyers, inflammatory pamphlets and chain letters reached even the most remote corners. The propaganda mostly relied on two main points. First, they promised that everyone could now live a better life in a province of their choosing. It didn't matter that those territories needed to be conquered first, the supposed might of the Führer was also heavily propagated everywhere. The second promise, or rather, a threat, was that those who decided to stay would be forcefully resettled to Sicily, Abyssinia or any other part of southern Italy. Those were only rumours. The Italian government had no such plans, but said rumours were incredibly effective. And where propaganda failed, the VKS resorted to terror. Those who decided to stay were defamed as Jews, traitors or gypsies. One Remainer was covered in manure, children of Remainers were pelted with stones, windows were shattered, and some barns were set on fire. It is very difficult to say how many of the 230,000 South Tyrolians actually opted for German citizenship, but it is most commonly agreed that about 86% made the decision to leave their homes. The Italian side reported a lower number, of 72.5%, so as to not concede that the Italianization measures were a complete failure. Nevertheless, how was the resettlement actually conducted? Already in September of 1939, the Amtliche Deutsche Ein- und Rückwanderungsstelle, or ADAST, under the leadership of Heinrich Himmler, was established in Bozen and other major cities, which was tasked with organising the emigration. German schools were reopened, where National Socialist ideas were taught with the goal of turning them into Volksgenossen. The propaganda was once more heavily pushed by both the German and the Italian sides, and those who opted to stay were still harassed on an almost daily basis. 
However, as time went on, it seemed like the Remainers actually made the correct choice, as the death reports from the Leavers who got conscripted into the Wehrmacht got higher, and as the myth of resettlement to southern Italy turned out to be a lie. But only few actually changed their minds, and the German Reich needed workers, soldiers and farmers. And so in November of 1939, the Italian government allowed 100 South Tyrolers to leave daily. That number would increase to 250 in the following year. Alright, let's take a look at the steps that Leavers had to take in order to be allowed to go. First, they had to go to an ADAS office and apply for citizenship. Of course, it was mandatory to provide proof that they were of Aryan origin. Should they have had any sort of estate, then that was usually sold off too. If the request was approved, they were given an exact date on which they had to be at the train station with their bags. Any settler's first stop was Innsbruck, where they had to register themselves at the Hotel Victoria. If there was work and an available place to stay somewhere else, they would have been redirected there. If not, then they would temporarily have been sent to a transit camp. To combat the lack of housing for the 75,000 people that actually left South Tyrol, about 11,000 flats were constructed all over Austria, in Tyrol, Salzburg, Styria, Vorarlberg and in Carinthia. In Innsbruck alone, 1,859 flats were built. By the way, the blueprints for the accommodations were designed by Peter Koller, who is famous for planning the Volkswagen city in Wolfsburg. As the war progressed, the number of people actually leaving South Tyrol dwindled drastically, and the reason for that was that there was just no final settlement area. At first, Alsace-Lorraine was considered. In 1914, Himmler suggested that Burgundy should be the new home for South Tyrolers, and that the local cities should just be renamed to Bozen, Meran, Brixen, etc. Hitler had different plans, and transferred Burgundy over to the Vichy regime. He instead suggested that Crimea would be a wonderful place for the Leavers in terms of both climate and landscape. The South Tyrolers should, in his opinion, create the new Reichsgautaurien and continue their lives as living proof of the National Socialist Racial Theory. But it was never specified which part of the Crimean Peninsula was actually supposed to be settled. Another reason for the decline of immigrants were the deteriorating conditions they began to find themselves under. The promises of a flat and a big pile of land were usually just that, promises. Many South Tyrolers were put in emergency accommodation, such as cloisters, barracks or other people's houses. On top of that, it was very difficult for many to properly integrate into their new homes. Many settlers were workers, people without possessions or farm labourers who spoke a weird and foreign dialect which alienated many people in Vorarlberg and Germany proper especially. A lot of South Tyrolers who came from a more rural background often struggled with their new lives in a city, resorting to crime and forgetting to pay their rents. The resettlement programme ended when the Wehrmacht occupied northern Italy in autumn of 1943. While some South Tyrolers regarded the Germans as liberators from the Italian yoke, others, especially those who opted for Italy, feared for their lives. The repressions against them increased, and many members of the resistance, such as Friedel Volker, were imprisoned in concentration camps. After the war had ended, the Allies decided that South Tyrol should remain a part of Italy. Still, a compromise was met in the Gruber de Gasperi Agreement between Austria and Italy, which granted South Tyrol extensive autonomies and made German an official language in the region. Furthermore, the Hitler-Mussolini Agreement of 1939 was made invalid, and all those who opted to leave, and their children, were allowed to return back home. But of the almost 75,000 people who left, only about 20,000 decided to take up on that opportunity. The South Tyrolian option remains one of the most controversial and painful chapters of the region's history, and was considered a taboo topic for quite a long time. Many leavers were defamed as traitors to South Tyrol for a long time, during a time where politicians of the region tried to unite the local population and urged them to forget about the whole thing and just work together. Still today, the memory runs very painfully deep in many South Tyrolian families, and the bilingual signs or place names remain a very controversial topic. Alright then, danke schön for watching the video. A very special and grateful thanks goes out to A Cup of Tea and James for their generous support on Ko-Fi. You are fantastic. Have a very wonderful day and see you next time.